Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And tonight we're going to start out with two men of letters, and while they both had extensive and impressive literary careers, each one contributed one specific piece of literature essential to America, and both of them were made into iconic films, which enhanced their reputation. And we're going to start out with Edward Albee, who died recently at the age of 88. He was probably America's greatest living playwright at the time he died. He was adopted as a baby by a wealthy suburban New York couple, and he had an extremely unstable childhood. And much of his playwriting was a reflection of his revolt against middle-class values and middle-class society. His first great work was Zoo Story, which he wrote in the 1950s. He also wrote A Delicate Balance, and he won a number of Tonys and Pulitzers. He was an influence on several generations of playwrights, most notably Tom Stoddard in Great Britain. Here's an AP report on the death of Edward Albee. By the time I got to the second act... Three-time Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Edward Albee who was considered the playwright of his generation and wrote Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, has died at his home in Montauk, New York. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which won a Tony and is considered Albee's finest play, opened on Broadway in 1962 and was made into an award-winning film in 1966, starring Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. His unconventional style won him great acclaim, but he also suffered a 20-year drought of critical and commercial recognition before his 1994 play, Three Tall Women, garnered him his third Pulitzer Prize. Tonight, our nation... In 1996, then-President Bill Clinton awarded him a National Medal of the Arts, and he won his second Tony for Best Play in 2002 with The Goat, or Who is Sylvia? In more than 30 plays, he skewered such mainstays of American culture as marriage, child-rearing, religion, and upper-class comforts. Well, as a reporter said, his greatest work was Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in the 1966 film starring the real-life husband and wife Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor was probably the greatest example of a husband and wife team playing a husband and wife team in film history. They're great together, and I played the standard scene of them fighting in front of George Siegel and Sandy Dennis when I did the Elizabeth Taylor podcast. So I'm going to play a different clip. This is a great scene of Elizabeth Taylor channeling her inner Betty Davis while she munches on a piece of fried chicken. What a dump. Hey, what's that from? What a dump. How would I know? Oh, come on. What's it from? You know. Martha. What's it from, for Christ's sake? What's what from? I just told you. I just did it. What a dump. Huh? What's that from? I have the faintest idea. Dumbbell. It's from some damn Betty Davis picture. Some goddamn Warner Brothers everything. Martha, I can't remember all the pictures that came out of Warner Brothers. Asking you to remember every goddamn Warner Brothers epic. Just one, just one single little epic. That's all. Betty Davis gets peritonitis at the end. And she wears this big black front wig, all throughout the picture, and she's married to Joseph Cotton. Somebody. Somebody. And she wants to go to Chicago all the time because she's not an actor with the star. But she gets sick. And she sits down in front of her dressing table. What actor? What scar? I can't remember his name for God's sake. What's the name of the picture? I want to know what the name of the picture is. She got was pardoned on this. She decides to go to Chicago anyway. And Chicago. It's called Chicago. What? What is it? I mean, the picture. It's called Chicago. Oh, good. Don't you know anything? Chicago was a 30s musical starring little Miss Alice Faye. Don't you know anything? This picture. Betty Davis comes home from a hard day at the grocery store. She works in the grocery store? She's a housewife. She buys things. She comes home with the groceries, and she walks into the modest living room of a modest cottage, modest Joseph Cotton, Sarah. Are they married? And she, yes, they're married to each other, Clark. And she comes in, and she looks around this room, and she sets down her groceries. And she said, what a dump. She's discontent. Well, what's the name of the picture? I really don't know, Martha. Well, think. Well, the picture was the 1949 camp classic Beyond the Forest. 
but the playwright here was Edward Albee, and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is one of the landmark pieces of the 20th century. It was his magnum opus. Well, another author who wrote a landmark piece of literature was W.P. Kinsella, who died recently at the age of 81. W.P. Kinsella was from Western Canada. He was one of those weird Canadian authors that we feature every once in a while, guys like Farley Mowat. And in Canada, he won a lot of awards and faced a lot of criticism. Came down to the States to the University of Iowa, where he was inspired to write his magnum opus. But before we talk about it, here is the CBC on the death of W.P. Kinsella. He built it and they came. W.P. Kinsella's fictional universe drew readers of all stripes, from baseball lovers to those who needed a bit of magic. Yeah! Me and Silas are going to be studying to be licensed mechanics. Edmonton-born Kinsella's first novel was 1977's Dance Me Outside. Later turned into a movie, it took place on a First Nation in Alberta. Kinsella was criticized for appropriating the voices of Cree people. Some even called him racist, something he dismissed as nonsense of Eastern Canadian academics. But Kinsella's most famous writing revolved around his passion, baseball. There is theoretically no distance that a great hitter couldn't hit the ball or a great fielder couldn't run to retrieve it. And the, that makes for myth and for larger-than-life characters. The most popular of his baseball novels, Shoeless Joe, inspired the movie Field of Dreams. You build a baseball field in the middle of nowhere, and you sit here and you stare at nothing. It was seen as a quintessentially American story. Americans, when they read something that they like, they say, by golly, I like that. Let's write to this fellow and tell him I liked it. Uh, Canadians, if they read something and they like it, they say, gee, I like that. There must be something wrong with it. Unafraid of controversy till the very end. In a statement, his literary agent called him a unique, creative, and outrageously outspoken man. Kinsella would probably be okay with that assessment. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, as the reporter says, his great work was Shoeless Joe, which was made into the movie Field of Dreams. And that one has certainly entered into the American consciousness. Here's Timothy Busfield hawking Kevin Costner, and all of a sudden James Earl Jones appears with the 1919 Chicago White Sox and the cornfield diamond behind him. All right, all right, all right, all right. This is fascinating. It is. But the fact remains is that you don't have the money to bring the mortgage up to date, so you're still going to have to sell. I'm sorry, Ray. We got no choice. Ray, people will come, Ray. They'll come to Iowa. For reasons they can't even fathom. They turn up your driveway, not knowing for sure why they're doing it. They'll arrive at your door, as innocent as children, longing for the past. Of course, we won't mind if you look around, you say. It's only $20 per person. They'll pass over the money without even thinking about it. For it is money they have, and peace they like. Ray, just sign the papers. And they'll walk out to the bleachers. Sit in shirt sleeves on a perfect afternoon. But find you have reserved seats somewhere along one of the baselines. But they sat when they were children and cheered their heroes. And they watched the game. And it'll be as if they dipped themselves in magic waters. The memories will be so thick that I have to brush them away from their faces. Ray, when the bank opens in the morning, they'll foreclose. People will come, Ray. You're broke, Ray. You sell now or you lose everything. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. But baseball has marked the time. This field, this game, it's a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good and it could be again. Oh, people will come, Ray. People will most definitely come. Hey, James Earl Jones and Elizabeth Taylor on the same podcast. How can you go wrong? When I was a boy, I took my son out to the baseball field right outside of Dyersville, Iowa. My son got to field a couple of grounders on the field of dreams before they kicked everybody off. At the time, half the field was owned by the movie studio, and the other half was owned by a private family. And it was the one private farmer who was giving everybody a hard time. I think they both sold out now to some big corporation and everybody can come there. Fields in the middle of nowhere in northeastern Iowa. But if you're in that neighborhood, it's worth the turnoff to see it.
and you can probably buy some souvenir book about W.P. Kinsella. Well, we're going to move on now to Charmian Carr, who will always be 16, going on 17 to her fans, but she died recently at the age of 73. I have to do this one for my wife because her favorite movie is the 1965 Sound of Music, and Charmian Carr played an iconic character in that movie, Liesel Von Trapp. And are you ready for this? She beat out Patty Duke, Sharon Tate, and Mia Farrow for that role. Here is U.S. News & World Report on the death of Charmian Carr. Was Liesel? The legend behind the Von Trapp's rebellious daughter Liesel Von Trapp in the Academy Award winning Sound of Music film has died. Actress Charmaine Carr was 73 years old. Carr was just in her early 20s when she played the role of Liesel, the eldest of the seven children of stern widower Captain Von Trapp. She later distanced herself from her acting career to pursue interior design and start a family. She is survived by two children and four grandchildren. By the way, her name is pronounced Charmian, not Charmaine. Charmian after one of Cleopatra's servants. And she pretty much left show business after that role. She was the interior decorator for Michael Jackson's house in Encino, though. Said he was a weird dude. How can we leave Charmian Carr without that iconic song? Oh, well, you're such a baby. I'm 16. What's such a baby about that? I am 16, growing on 17, I know that I'm naive. Fellows I meet may tell me I'm sweet and willingly I believe. I am 16, growing on 17, innocent as a rose. Bachelor dandies, drinkers of brandies, what do I know of those? As the years go by, I am more proud of it than I was in the beginning because in the beginning we didn't know it was going to be so successful and a year would go by and two years would go by and then five years and ten years. But it's brought so much happiness to so many people and that makes me feel so good. There you go, dear. That one was for you. Well, tonight we're going to close with Cecil Bustamante Campbell, a.k.a. Prince Buster, who died at the age of 78. Prince Buster was a nice Jamaican boy born on the west side of Kingston and he became one of the pioneers of ska music. In 1962, Jamaica gained its independence from Great Britain, but around that time, Jamaica was also gaining its independence from American music, and Prince Buster, among others, developed a form of rhythm music using guitar, bass, drum, saxophone, and horns that became known as ska and caught on heavily in Great Britain in the mid-60s. He was the forerunner in Great Britain of rock steady music, and here in the United States, although we're not that familiar with ska, it was also the forerunner of reggae music. So it's a little bit Caribbean calypso, a little bit jazz, a little bit of R&B, but the sound of ska is distinct. Prince Buster never had any big hits in the United States, but to give you an example of ska, here's one of his big hits from the mid-60s in Great Britain called Madness. Madness, madness, they call it madness. Madness, madness, they call it madness. It's plain, you see, that is what they mean to me. Madness, madness, I call it madness. Prince Buster also did some pretty good covers in a ska version. Here's My Girl. We've played the Temps version. We've played Otis Redding's version. We've played my particular favorite, the Mamas and Papas. Here's the Motown classic in ska by Prince Buster. I got sunshine on a cloudy day. Well, it's cold outside. I've got the month of May. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps. And to close with Prince Buster, we're going to do another one of his covers. I'm wondering if Jamaica Television got CBS in 1964. If so, Prince Buster may have been watching the Beatles sing the first song they ever sang to America on Ed Sullivan. And he went ahead and covered it in ska. This is Prince Buster's ska version of All My Lovin'. Don't know if Sid's gonna like this one. Close your eyes and I 
I'll kiss you tomorrow. I will miss you. Remember, I'll always be true. And then while I'm away, I'll write all every day. And I'll say all my loving to you. All my loving I will send to you.